previously on the history of Al-Andalus. So in 1248, the last major city in Al-Andalus had fallen to the Catholic forces and helping the Catholics in this siege of Seville was a man called Muhammad. Yes, he was a Muslim. And this man, Muhammad ibn Ahmar from the Banu Nasr tribe or the Nasrid tribe in English, had stepped in to fill the void that the al muwahhidun had left as they were retreating from Al-Andalus. And the reason why he was helping Ferdinand in the siege of Seville was because Ferdinand had agreed to recognize him as the ruler of a new small kingdom in the southeast of the peninsula in some mountains, providing he helped in the siege of Seville. So was Muhammad ibn Ahmar being treacherous to the Muslims, being beneficial to Islam, or maybe even both? Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar had managed to get his hands on a few small towns in the Sierra Nevada mountains, towns such as Hain and Arona, towns you've never heard of before because that's how insignificant they are. He'd also managed to get his hands on uh, Jabal Tariq, Gibraltar and al Maria port cities. Now Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar had three main objectives. The first one was to survive, the second one was to survive and the third one was to survive and the question was how was he going to do that because over the past 250 years the catholic states had conquered much more bigger and much more prestigious states than what he had and his state had no historical precedent and the rulers of of this new state had never been in positions of power before um, that was all going to change though when he got his hands on a, another town or city we should say and this city had played a very small role in the history of Al-Andalus to date. And that city was called Ramata or Granada. Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar was a bit of a wily fox when it came to politics and some of his tactics were just downright dirty. But to be honest with you, if you weren't like that in the 1200s and the 1300s in the Iberian Peninsula, you wouldn't have lasted very long. So he was certainly a man of his times and he agreed to pay King Ferdinand of Castile yearly tributary payments in return for peace for 20 years. What this also meant was that if any other state attacked Granada, Castile would have to come to the aid of Granada and defend. All this gave uh, Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar exactly what he needed. He had time to build his new kingdom and get ready for the future when this deal was going to run out. He would, be go on, he would go on to be known as Muhammad I of the Nasrid dynasty that ruled here in Granada. kingdom of Granada was protected by its geography and the Muslims found the northern area of Spain very difficult to conquer because of the mountains. That area is Astorias and the mountains were the Cantabrian mountains. This area, Granada, was protected by the Sierra Nevada mountains over there and Muhammad I managed to build many fortresses and military towns along the, the range of the mountains in order to make any land invasion through the mountains pretty much impossible. He also began to fortify the Alhambra and much of what you see in the Al-Kadaba 
which is the military fortress portion of the Alhambra is attributed to him and his defensive preparations. population that Muhammad I was now ruling it rose dramatically because many Muslims were not happy at being the subjects of Catholic rulers in Castile and Aragon therefore they started to migrate en masse into the Kingdom of Granada and ended up living here and for them it turned out to be a good move because they then lived in a secure area where they could practice their faith also what this meant for Muhammad I was that he had huge numbers of people who would be able to fight if ever needed in a battle. And you can see where they came from over the hills from the Kingdom of Castile. This population and its identity so the old classification of Arab Muslim, Berber Muslim and Muwallad Muslim had gone by now and there's only really an Andalusi Muslim identity. But one thing that pushed them further together is that they were living on the edge because they knew that this kingdom was just in its beginnings and was slightly weak and they were concentrating on external issues so they forgot about their, uh, their internal problems between them that used to be there in the past also this new population would work and therefore they would make money and therefore Muhammad I was able to tax them and this tax that he got from his population helped him greatly to pay the yearly tributary payments to Castile but from all the work that they did and all the goods that they produced all these goods now needed to be traded and that's where the next important point comes in. This part of the world today is the meeting point of three states. Gibraltar, which is um, a British overseas territory. Across there is Algeciras, controlled by Spain. And across the Straits, you might just be able to see the mountains of Morocco. However, in the 1200s and the 1300s, the three players at this particular point on the map were very different. Gibraltar, Jabal Tariq was controlled by the Emirate of Granada. Algeciras was controlled by the Kingdom of Castile. And North Africa was controlled by a new dynasty called the Banu Marin or the Merinids in English and the relationship between these three states was very complex forever changing and never ever ever stable and it played a huge role in the survival of the Emirates of Granada. Emirate of Granada wanted to control Gibraltar, Jabal Tariq, uh, to prevent the Castilians having a land route into their empire and potentially finishing off their kingdom. Uh, it was also good to control this for trade purposes across the way um, with North Africa. The Castilians on the other hand uh, were very keen to take Gibraltar because then obviously they could uh, go by land and attack the Emirate of Granada. And last but not least, the Marinids in North Africa were very keen to hold Gibraltar because then they would control both sides of the Straits um, and then that was very good for trade purposes. Sometimes they wanted to keep the Emirate of Granada in charge here to keep the Castilians at bay because the Castilians were an, uh, an emerging power. Now, what this meant was that at any given time Whoever was in charge here, um, there would be someone else who wasn't happy with the situation. And that would lead 
to two of the three allying together against the third so sometimes the Marinids in North Africa would ally with the Castilians and sometimes the Castilians would, the Castilians would ally with the Emirate of Granada um, and sometimes the two Muslim powers would ally together against each other against Castile so in, in this time period what religion you were whether you were Catholic or whether you were Muslim didn't really matter it was all about politics it was all about protecting your throne it was all about economics and some would say not much has changed these days ironically the kingdom of Granada was economically advantageous for the kingdom of Castile so they weren't always trying to conquer it all the time and a lot of the time they were just using it as a cash cow other times uh, Castile had internal problems with internal rebellions or even succession crises when a series of young rulers came to the throne but they were too young to rule all these factors contributed to the existence of Granada in its fragile state so let me know what you think about Muhammad ibn al-Ahmar Muhammad the first of the Nasr dynasty was he a good guy or was he a bad guy? Was he treacherous to the Muslims? Did he help Islam or did he do a bit of both? Let me know in the comment section below. When Muhammad I died, he was followed by Muhammad II, who was followed by Muhammad III who was followed by a man called Nasser, who was then followed by a man called Ismail I, who was followed by a man called Muhammad IV, until we had Yusuf I. And it was during his rule, Yusuf I, in 1340, that the situation uh, at the Straits of Gibraltar was firmly in favor of the Emirate of Granada, who controlled Gibraltar, and the Marinids of North Africa. And they both saw that the kingdom of Castile was very weak so they decided to attack together and the Marinids came over with uh, a force of about 60,000 men and for some reason they brought their whole treasury with them as well um, and it shows how confident or overconfident they were um, and the plan was to take another port city which is just to the west of Algeciras and it's called Tarifa and unfortunately for these two powers um, they were too, over, too overconfident and the result was that they were completely run over the kingdom of Castilla had actually sought help from the kingdom of Portugal and the two of them combined to defeat the two Muslim powers Yusuf the first the Emir of Granada had to flee back to Granada and the Marinids having thousands of their men killed and the whole treasury taken by the Kingdom of Castile had to flee as well and what's very significant about this point is that in 711 the first uh, bunch of Berbers came over to begin the Islamic presence in the Iberian Peninsula after this battle in 1340 which they lost just outside of Tarifa uh, and the Marinids fled back to North Africa from that point onwards there would never ever ever be any more North African involvement in the internal affairs militarily on the Iberian Peninsula which left the Emirate of Granada all alone by itself in its survival against the Castilians and the Aragonese In 1350 the Castilians returned and this time having gained all the loot from the Marinids they had revamped their army and they were ready for a long siege of Gibraltar to take it from the Emir of Granada and as I said earlier the Emir of Granada was now isolated and no one was going to come to help them so they feared the worst they thought that this siege was going to be the end of them Castilians were camped at night ready to start the battle the next day then they woke up in the morning 
and their king who was dead they inspected his body they found some black spots they looked at the, the rest of the army a few more people had some black spots and then they realized the plague had arrived the black death well, had infected a huge proportion of the army and killed the king therefore they had to call the siege off and had to march back to Seville ironically the black death had given life to the emirate of Granada a series of events occurred which reveal the complexities of Granada's internal politics and it also shows how her internal politics was very much dependent on the surrounding states namely Castile and the Merides in North Africa. Yusuf I had died and his son Mohammed V had ascended to the throne. He ruled for about nine years and then he was deposed in a coup by his half-brother called Ismail. He became Ismail II and entered the palace to start ruling as the Sultan as the Emirate of Granada whereas Muhammad V went into exile with the Merinids in North Africa. Ismail II had a co-conspirator and you guessed it his name was Muhammad but the problem was Ismail and Muhammad had a falling out and that led to Muhammad doing a coup over Ismail to come to power and these two people were second cousins. So Muhammad then had his men take Ismail down to the dungeons of the Alhambra palace and assassinated and that allowed him to become the Sultan or the Emir of the Emirate of Granada and he became Muhammad the sixth. But remember we have two Muhammads on the scene now. We have Muhammad the sixth here in the palace and we also have Muhammad the fifth who is in exile in North Africa with the Merinids. Mohammed VI decided to stop paying tributary payments to the Kingdom of Castile and instead pay them to the Kingdom of Aragon. And as you can imagine, the Kingdom of Castile didn't like that because they were getting a lot of good income from the Emirate of Granada for many years. It was, this was a bit of a bold move by Muhammad VI because it was these payments which kept the Kingdom of Granada safe for many, many, many years. The Kingdom of Castile wanted this money, so they decided to contact Muhammad V, who was in North Africa, and encourage him to make a comeback. The leader of Seville managed to lure Muhammad VI into his territory and have him assassinated near Seville. He then sent his head to Muhammad V who was in exile and then Muhammad V made his way back to the Alhambra palace to become the Sultan of the Emir of Granada once again and this time he would rule for 29 years. So why did Castile help Muhammad V? Because Muhammad V agreed to pay them the tributary payments and not send it to Aragon. These events show us that external powers had a major say in determining who was sat on the seat of power in the palace of Alhambra for the Emirate of Granada. It also shows the weakness of the Emirate of Granada and it shows you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Just because when you look at the Alhambra building it looks amazing, don't think that the way the people were ruling in there were amazing as well. However, being fair and having said that, 
the constant battle of survival that these rulers were engaged in did allow the 500,000 strong Muslim population of Granada to live in peace and to practice their faith which would be a problem later on. This shows that the Catholic states in the north, north in particular Castile, preferred sometimes that the Emir of Granada was alive and well and paying tribute rather than reconquering it. And this uh, relationship between Muhammad V and Pedro, uh, the cruel of Castile, actually went a lot further than helping him regain the throne here in the Emir of Granada. They actually allied together to attack Aragon. So reducing the events of medieval Spain to a conflict between two different religions is very oversimplistic over and is not corroborated by the facts on the ground. There was also a mutual friendship between these two and a mutual appreciation of each other's culture to the extent that Pedro built his castle in Seville, the Real al Kadar, and when he made it, he made it in a Muslim style so it looks exactly like the Alhambra Palace. There was Quranic inscriptions there, Arabic inscriptions, and also on one of the uh, title frames, it says his name and he calls himself the Sultan of Castile, not the King of Castile. So I'm going to show you a videos of the Nasrid palaces here built by Muhammad V and videos of the Real al Qadar in Seville built by Pedro the Cruel. And let's see if you can tell which one is which. The first set of videos were from the Real al Qadar in Seville and the second set of videos were from here, the Nasrid palaces within the Alhambra palace complex. Well done to all those who got that right. It's funny to think that the Nasrid palaces and the Alhambra palace is one of Spain's biggest tourist attractions, if not the biggest, and it makes me wonder if Ferdinand and Isabella would be turning in their graves if they knew that fact. And if you don't know who Ferdinand and Isabella are, don't worry, because you're going to find out in the next episode. If you think the saga of Mohammed V of Granada involved dirty politics and shenanigans, wait till you see what happens in the next episode, because that is a tale of lust, love, revenge, deceit, political ambition, and downright stupidity. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and press the bell button so you don't miss out.